Continue with the basic sets today. So, first, uh, as we said in the last class yesterday, that we have we have to choose first the basis that we want to choose for the atomic orbitals. So, one of the basis that is very common is valence only basis. which essentially means for the first row atoms like carbon you have 1s, 2s and 2p. For the hydrogen it is just 1s. So, that is called the valence only basis and these are typically Slater orbitals all right uh, which will be expanded in terms of Gaussian. So, we will that is a general philosophy for all atomic orbitals. So, first we will only describe the atomic orbital set. Then we said valence double zeta. Please note that when we say valence only basis, we are still including carbon 1s because core cannot be completely neglected. What I mean by valence only is that polarization function won't be there. We can simply call it valence basis. So that in basically it means that up to valence it will be there. So, then you have a valence double zeta which means carbon will have just 1s and the actual valence 2s 2p will be doubled as 2s prime 2p prime. So, 2s 2p 2s prime 2p prime and for hydrogen this will be also 1s 1s prime because hydrogen 1s itself is valence. So, I am first describing what are the atomic orbitals the Slater type of functions. Slater functions. What are the Slater functions that are there? So, <coughs> so this will be the hydrogen 1s 1s prime and up to this point we said. We further said however, we do not use any Slater orbitals. Each Slater function is expanded as a linear combination of Gaussian functions of Gaussian functions and we, we decide to call this primitive Gaussians. So, a primitive Gaussian which you call let us say PGF primitive Gaussian function, a primitive Gaussian for S type is typically some constant k into e to the minus alpha r minus r a mod square which is centered on atom a <coughs> all right whereas slater has only r mod r minus r a okay so so then it means that e slater function so i have a slater function of s type which would be now on center A, which would be now written as a linear combination of various Gaussians. So, PGF, which are, <coughs> which are characterized by the exponent alpha, which I just call alpha i. So, what is required is of course going to be S type, that is quite clear, that is S type Gaussian, because I am expanding S type atomic orbital. So, what we require in our basis expansion is to know for E Slater function, let us say L number of Gaussians. So, what is the length of the Gaussian and what are these coefficients and the exponent. As we said that each Slater cannot be written as one primitive Gaussian. So, it has to be a linear combination of primitive Gaussian. The two important difference between Slater and primitive Gaussians we highlighted that at r equal to 0, its derivative is 0, whereas in the case of the Slater, it is non-zero. So, that behavior is different. At r equal to infinity, this decays much more rapidly than the Slater because of the fact that you have a square. I, I hope all of you realize why at r equal to 0, it is 0. If you take a derivative of r square, r will come out and r will make it 0. 
whereas in the case of just exponential minus r, it will now not become 0, it will remain non-zero. So, I think that is a very simple algebra that you should be able to do, I just told these two differences. And because of these two differences as well as the differences in the intermediate re region, S later cannot be mapped to one primitive. So, it has to be mapped to a combination of primitive and this is usually preset. This combination is usually preset from an atomic calculation, from an earlier atomic calculation. So, this is something, these coefficients are not something which are part of the SCF. These are known, using this we actually calculate the atomic orbitals, atomic orbital integrals for the valence only. So, before I go forward to further basis where I include more than valence, let us spend some time and look at two particular basis sets which are of use double zeta valence and this is actually a name given by Dunning and Huzinaga. Okay, Huzinaga Dunning. Another is 631G, 431G type, 321G, etc. type, which are which are the Popel's basis. So I will I will just try to explain these two examples. Of course, there may be many many basis sets, just to tell you what this means. So first, the Huzinaga Dunning basis. In the Huzinaga Dunning basis, the core remains single zeta. So that means core is not expanded core remains uh, as one function. Of course, core will be expanded in terms of primitive Gaussians, but core is not expanded in terms of 2. Okay? So, what will happen is that you have an expansion for 1s function. So, you have an expansion of 1s function in terms of PGFs. So, we will worry about how many functions and all that expansion in terms of PGFs. So, some number will be expanded and then you have 2s, 2s prime. 2p, 2p prime. These are expanded again in terms of primitive Gaussian with some exponent, some exponent and some coefficients. Usually what is done is that these exponents are kept same for both s and p, but not for the prime and unprime. They are, that is that is different, but whatever you use for 2s would be same for 2p, 2s prime would be same for 2p prime. So, one of the basis that was very commonly used by Huzinaga Dunning was called 9s 5p stroke 3s 2p for example. I will explain this why this is double zeta valence. The first in the bracket are number of primitive Gaussians which are used. So, total number of primitive Gaussians used are 9s type 5p type. From this 9 S type and 5 t p type, we use, we, we construct a contraction, this is called the contraction. So, these are often, these are also called contracted Gaussian function, CGF, just like these are called PGF. So, now actually we do not work with letter function, we work with contracted Gaussian. So, we contract this 9 S type to 3 S type functions and 5 p type to 2 p type. What are those 3 s type functions? That is very clear. You have 1 s, 2 s, 2 s prime and these are 2 p, 2 p prime. Please note that these 3 and 2 are not the principal quantum numbers. These are just the total number. Okay? So, these are 3 total number of s types. This is total number of p type. We judge that in this case it happens to be 2 p, 2 p prime. So, do not confuse. And you have a total number of PGFs which are 9. 5. So, out of the 9 S type, few of them will be used for 1 S and a few for 2 S, few for 2 S prime. Okay? So, typically what is used is for 1 S we use uh, 6 core, a uh, 6 primitive Gaussian out of the 9. For 2 S we use 3, one of them become common okay? and 2 S prime is usually uncontracted. So, 1. So, 3 PGF, this is 1 PGF. So, it, it appears that 6 plus 3 plus 1, 10, you do not have 10 here, but one of them is actually common, common Gaussian. Okay? And each for each of this expansion, you have coefficients. Okay? Those are actually lists that is given to you. It is not important, but just to remember. This prime 
remains uncontracted. This is actually called uncontracted because I am using only one primitive. Now you may you may argue with this, but then this is only an additional basis to 2s to 2s prime. So it does not matter. One one is sufficient because actual 2s is taking care. So it has three number of 2s. So similarly, you have p functions which are which are usually make four and 2p prime they make one. This was usual Huizenaga Dunning convention. So this is just one typical basis. So 5p is contracted 4 plus 1 5. So this is a typical basis that I am just giving you, but you can have n number of basis. In fact, there are further basis in which this can be 13s, you know, this can be 7p contracted to 3s 2p only. So, so that means I am for each of them I am using more number of primitives and always more the merrier, please understand. More here, more here, everywhere more is better, okay, in basis set. So I can keep on expanding my basis set. Question is that if you have more number, somewhere or other computational time will increase. So that is where you have to play the balancing game, okay. So this is typically the Huizenaga dunning basis set. I will explain now the Popol's basis set because this is more commonly used today. In fact, it is interesting that the Huizenaga dunning basis set is almost uh, outdated today. Most people use Popol's basis set after the Gaussian has come. So that is of course marketing because Popol started the Gaussian. So Popol of course does not use Huizenaga dunning basis set in Gaussian, all right. So eventually people have forgotten Huizenaga dunning basis set. That is unfortunate. Uh, I may also say that the Huizenaga gave the primitive Gaussians coefficients and Dunning gave the contractions. That is Dunning gave these coefficients, Huizenaga devised this alpha i's. What are the primitive Gaussians? So that is their contribution, Huizenaga and Dunning. But it is almost forgotten today. Everybody uses this 631g, 431g, etc. So I will now come to explain this. These are actually much easier. So let us say I start with 631g, which is a very, very common basis set. So 631g essentially means this dash is very important. This dash separates core from the valence. So this 6 is the number of primitive Gaussians used to expand 1s. These 3 are the number of primitive Gaussian that is used to expand 2s and this is uncontracted for 2s prime. So this 6, 3, 1 are actually not the number of atomic orbitals. They are the number of primitive Gaussians for each atomic orbital. So when I write 631g, first you have to understand that is this. So this is basically double zeta valence of Huizenaga Dunning. Coefficients are different, exponents are different. That is all, that is all the difference. So number of orbitals, number of atomic orbitals used in this basis set and Huizenaga Dunning basis set is identical. Number of atomic orbitals, that is number of contracted Gaussian which is used finally this letter function they are identical that number is 1s 2s 2s prime 2p 2p prime so 631g essentially says this and then for 2p 2p prime you use exactly the same contract same exponents 3 and 1 okay so just just like the huizenaga and dunning basis huizenaga dunning is also used similar those 5p huh 4 and 1 that is a little different and their exponents are a little bit different from the S. Here whatever they are using for S type the same exponents they use for P type. So this is very typical of the Popol's contraction that the exponents are actually identical here, same exponent they share. Only the contraction coefficients will be different, okay. So this is the Popol's basis set. So you can see that it is very pretty much the same. So you have one S letter function which is expanded in terms of 6 PGF and then your 2s and 2s prime are expanded in 3 and 1. So it is pretty much uh, what the Huizenaga and Dunning did, values are a little bit different and the same goes for 2p and 2p prime. What is interesting in Popol's basis is that they share the common exponents, okay. Th that is a very special feature which is not there in Huizenaga Dunning and in fact 3 and 1. Huizenaga Dunning, they not even use 3 and 1, they use 4 and 1, but that is any minor difference, you know, 3 and 4 are minor differences. So this is basically 631G. If you now take another basis set, so for example, 431G, now you can yourself tell what is 431G. 
What is 4, 3, 1, 0 now? Same number except the 1s is 4. Now, no difference. Yeah, first row. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. Yeah, first row atoms. So, it is exactly, exactly the same. Yeah, 4. So, if I now use 3, 2, 1, G, it is exactly the same. So, you let then have 3, this will be 2, this will be 2. That is it. But as long as I am using of before dash 1 entry, after dash 2 entries, it means it is this basis. That is important. Of course, if I do for hydrogen, I should also tell for the hydrogen, then this is immaterial. You just look at 1s, 1s prime, both are valid. So, you use accordingly 6, 3, 1 g, 4, 3, 1 g, how many contractions are there for hydrogen 1s. This is, this is no longer important. That is all. So, so, if you look at these basis sets, they are pretty much same, Dunning and Huzinaga and Popul, but yeah, exponents are different, total number may be different and you can keep changing. Of course, these numbers can be made as big as possible. You know, 61G is typically good, but people use more, more number, uh, as I said, more the merrier. So, the point that we are trying to say that these 6 or 3, 2, 1 has nothing to do with the number of contracted functions. The number of contracted functions are decided by number of entries. Okay. So, this, these are only the number of uh, contractions used for contracted function and this is preset from an atomic calculation. So, they do not really come in the Hartree form. So, initial calculation of course, becomes expensive. The calculation of the 1 and 2 electron integrals become more expensive and I will come to that because you have to expand that in terms of primitive Gaussians eventually to calculate as I discussed last in the last class only once you have to do. But once you have done that, the rest of the Hartree for calculation does not depend on these numbers per se 3, 2, 1, but what it depends is the number of entries because they define my number of atomic orbitals, contracted atomic orbital, which become my basis set M. That capital M that I was talking will be decided by this number. So, let us look at that number now. Either Huzinaga Dunning double zeta valence or the Popol's basis, the number is same. Quite clearly, because each of them uses 1s, 2s, 2s prime, 2p, 2p prime, right. So, number is actually same. So, your total number m in SCF calculation remains the same except the quality of the integrals will be different because the quality of integral will depend on expanse and on terms of Gaussians. So, can you calculate the number? Let us say I am doing a calculation of methane. What will be the total number of atomic orbitals, contracted atomic orbitals? which will generate total number of molecular orbitals. Let us say there is no linear dependence. So, your total number of MOs that will be generated, your Fock matrix, M by M Fock matrix, what is that M? Can you tell me now? How do we calculate? Remember, P is threefold degenerate. So, whatever we are doing for P, I should also tell you, we do exactly same for Px, Py, Pz. So, now you tell me what is the number? 9. Total methane. I have carbon, I have hydrogen. No, what is the total number of contracted Gaussians? What is the total number for this basis? Yeah. This basis is same as this basis or this is double zeta valence of Huzinaga Dunning because number of contracted functions are identical 1s, 2s, 2s prime, 2p, 2p prime. Hydrogen 1s, 1s prime. Yes, yeah, so who said 17? You are right. You have 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, okay, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. What is so difficult about it? You have 4 hydrogen, each of them has 2 orbitals, so 8, 8 already. For carbon, you have 3 plus 6, 9. So, if you do a calculation of methane, and this is very important, in double zeta valence of Huzinaga Dunning, you will get total 17 atomic orbitals. Your SCF will be 17 by 17. Your number of molecular orbitals will be 17, out of which, of course, these are special orbitals, remember. So, you have actually 34 spin orbitals, out of which actually 5 of them will be used for occupied orbitals. 
and the rest of the 12 will remain unoccupied. So, just want to explain to you because we did that Fock matrix Fc equal to Sc, etc. So, you get that many eigenvalues, eigen, eigenvectors. So, you get so many coefficients, sets of coefficients. The set of coefficients that you will get will be equivalent to 17 by 17 matrix, right. So, C will be 17 by 17 matrix. You will get 17 MOs, out of which only 5 will be used because this is a closed shell system. 5 will be used for Hartree-Fock. The rest of the 12 will be unoccupied. So, the lowest energy among them unoccupied will be called LUMO. The highest of the occupied will be called HOMO. So, if you do double zeta valence calculation with methane and if you do not get 17 orbital, there is some problem with the input. You should be able to find out something that you should go back and check what happened. Maybe there is a linear dependence, something was removed as I told you. That could happen and reducing the number, but it cannot increase anyway, all right. Now, if you do 3 to 1 g calculation for methane, what is the total number of molecular orbital that you will get? I am just saying what is the total number of MOs you will get, so that there is no confusion. That must be that M. If you do 3 to 1 g, good, very good, I just wanted to test it, yeah. <laughs> if you do 4 3 1 g, it is same, 6 3 1 g, it is same. Many people get confused because these numbers are increasing, 3, 4, 6, but it is same because you are still describing only this many number of atomic orbitals. What is happening is that the quality of the atomic orbitals in terms of the primitive Gaussian is changing. That is the only thing that is changing. So, when I go from 431G to 631G, the valence anyway remains same, only the 1S function is getting better because for the 1S function now I have used 6 instead of 4. So, obviously 1S function will be better than the 431G 1S function. That is all that is happening. So, have a better quality 1S function, but the number is same. Quality is determined by number of primitive Gaussians because I am anyway not using Slater. So, everything is an approximation. So, how good is this Slater or what I call contracted Gaussian that depends on the number L and also details of Di and alpha I assuming that they are almost similar, this will be certainly better than this and because the core is better you should also expect Hartree Fock results to be different. Although your basis is same, do not expect the Hartree Fock results to be same because the integrals will be different. The integrals involving the core orbital will be different because the core is different and hence the results will be different and actually results will be better here. By the variation theorem, always more the better. So, it will be lower, lower energy will be lower and you can do that calculation and see. Although it is a very minor difference, only the 1s core carbon is changing, nothing else is changing. So, the difference will be very, very minor in very few, last few digits will change, okay. 3 to 1g will be significantly worse because your valence, uh, not only core is 3, your valence is also got worse. One of the valence instead of 3, you are using 2 orbitals. So, it will get worse, but total dimension of the problem will be same. So, there are two different things. So, total number of MOs that I will get will be, I, that will be determined by the dimension of the Fock matrix. Is it clear? Yes. Core function usually requires, so one, one of the reason is that we are only using one core orbital, okay. So, that is why we try to ex do that as good as possible. So, that is why we usually core, usually we require a larger number of core. We do not have a double zeta. In fact, I do, did not tell you Huzinaga and Dunning when they first started, they actually said only double zeta, just dz. So, just dz if you do, that is not dzv, that means core is also expanded, 1s, 1s prime. So, if you do that for the methane calculation, you now have 18 orbitals. You know, if somebody has an old program, run dzv and dz, you will see one, suddenly one more MO has occurred. So, just because that carbon is also expanded, that was the original uh, Huzinaga Dunning, you know, those who read earlier papers. In fact, when we do, used to do calculation, it was double zeta. Double zeta valence I learned much later. And that is actually to be consistent with the Popol. Popol was always using double zeta valence. Because for Popol to use double zeta, he has to have two more entries here, two entries here. Because this is a separator between core and valence. So, this is the number of valence, this is the number of cores. So, you have to have different 
two entries, right? So let us say the 6 is split into 5 1, then 5 1 dash 3 1 g. Opal never invented this basis set. If you have such a basis set, it would mean core is also double zeta. But Popol never invented this basis set. So Popol never used double zeta actually. Popol always used double zeta valence. And then somewhere down the line, Huzinaga Dunning double zeta was also forgotten. People used Huzinaga Dunning double zeta valence. Because Popol showed actually, you know, you will have one extra atomic orbital and it really does not help the results. I think there are a lot of studies which are made to show that for the core one is sufficient. And then, 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 then you need more number of contractions. So you do it only once. So that is why all these are punched to just six instead of splitting them as five and one. So there are lots of literature and basis set, and and they are all trial and error. Many of them have come out of intuition. So many, many say that the basis set is more of an art than science. You know, it's probably a little bit of dramatic statement, but <laughs> but it is probably true that there, there it is more, more of art than science because you just do trial and error, you have some intuition and, and, and there is a lots of literature. So I, I will not go into those details but let me now say how do you calculate the integrals before I go over to the other basis sets, some of the other basis sets which are also there. So how do you calculate the integrals? So for example, I take a simple integral of mu h nu which is a one electron integral or mu nu. So each of these are now contracted Gaussian. So they will be expanded depending on the 1s, 2s, 2s prime, 2p, 2p prime, whatever, hydrogen 1s, it will be expanded. So let us say mu is expanded in terms of i equal to 1 to k, okay, some d mu i, then I have a Gaussian function, I call it just mu i, okay, h and then nu is expanded similarly as sum over j equal to let us say 1 to L dj nu and Gaussian function nu j. Is it clear? This is primitive Gaussians, PGL. So just as I, I used to do normal basis set expansion, I am expanded mu in terms of di mu pgf mu i. So this is this just shows that it is a mu at basis i is the number of the, the PGF, k number, nu has L number, everything can be different. So you have to keep track, dj nu, PGF nu g and of course, so the basic integration that you have to do is this. This is the basic integration that you have to do with the primitive Gaussians and fortunately these integrals can even be calculated in an analytic manner. There are a lot of not numerical, so analytic integrations are possible with the primitive Gaussian function and then all you do is to multiply with these coefficients which are now known. Remember these are already preset from an atomic calculation, so they do not come in the Hartree form. I had given you a step, calculate 1 and 2 electron integrals, so it will only come there because these numbers are already known, so you just calculate this. Similarly I do mu nu lambda sigma, 1 by r 1 to lambda sigma, so you will have now 4 summations. I, J, K, L, right? So, etc, etc, I, J, K, L and this can be I equal to 1 to K1, J equal to 1 to K2, L equal to a K equal to 1 to K3, L equal to 1 to K4. So, all different expansion for, I keep writing like this, D, I, mu, D, J, nu, D, K, uh, lambda, d k uh, d l sigma okay and then you have you have this expansion in terms of uh, i j p g f i mu p g f j nu right 1 by r 1 2 p g f uh, k lambda PGF L sigma, okay. So we just, I mean, it's a routine thing. I mean, just keep keep doing, keep track of your symbols. That's all. I mean, it's very simple. So all you need to do is to evaluate this integral. Again, I'm writing everything in Dirac notation. Uh, you can convert into Boolean notation. That's not important. So here, the real simplification is here, as I explained to you. 
because now they are a Gaussian, so they can be actually written in terms of only two Gaussians because this PGF i mu and PGF k lambda can be combined one into one, they can be combined into one Gaussian on a different center and here again this and this can be combined into another center. Of course, they have centers also now. So, you have to keep track which mu. So, mu has this center A, B, C, but I mean you can do that calculation, it is not very difficult. So, the real advantage is in the calculation of this integral and because of that the Gaussians were actually done. So, this is a complicated thing that is actually done, it is not so simple to calculate a two electron integral. But these are evaluated after this simplification of two Gaussians being converted to one Gaussian, they can be now evaluated completely analytically. So, there are fun function formulas, so these formulas are directly programmed which is very fast. So, you do all analytic integration, so people have done this integration is a very long thing, but for computer programmer you do not care, you take the last line like equal to final line, you just program that right, that is a formula programming. So, that is very quick. Okay, so, please uh, this is a there is a lot of literature that is done. In fact, there are papers by I think Sachs, somebody called Sachs in Journal of Mathematical Physics, lots of paper in the 1960s I think when the Gaussians were coming up, JMP Journal of Mathematical Physics. So, those who are mathematically oriented can read those papers, he has, he has many, many papers. How to, how to evaluate these integrals? Now, long papers. So, each of them may be 4, 5, S type, P type, D type, all different, okay, depending on that because obviously if it is P type, remember primitive Gaussian function will be different. It will not be just a exponential minus alpha because there will be R to the power something, correct. P type has also X, Y, Z, right. So, R to the power 1 depending on what is the quantum number. So, so, so they have actually done for everything and very, very long papers, a lot of mathematics, you know, I tried to read through once. I found that probably is not useful to read through because I mean they have done it so you everybody trusts their mathematics is right. What is important is the final formula for the programmer and they just take the final formula. But those, those of you are actually interested in integral evaluation in terms of Gaussian can go back, the, all the literature is available and read uh, those papers. All right, we will go forward. This is not the only basis set that you can use as I said. We have, so once you understand the integral evaluation in terms of primitive Gaussians, 